Thank you. Thank you and welcome to Scripture and Tradition. We bring you insights from the Bible using the apostolic tradition, that is, the tradition going back to the apostles as the way to see it in its wider context. Now today, we're going to begin a new Bible study on our show. We hope that you got some better understanding and real encouragement from the time we spent talking about salvation as we went through the Bible study on the book Saved. We received a number of really great comments from viewers who are using our shows on salvation along with my book, Saved, a Bible study guide for Catholics, as their group Bible study. I meet them too. It's really cool how much they like it. Many, many people gained a deeper understanding of the scriptural basis for salvation and some of the issues surrounding it through their individual study. But today, we'll be talking about the Eucharist. Now, of course, some of you may say that Catholics know all about the Eucharist because they go and see it every time they attend Mass on Sunday if you get into dark in a church door. Not so fast, cowboys. <laughs> a recent Pew Research study showed that less than a third of Catholics believe in transubstantiation, which is the technical term that refers to the real presence of Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. That's a basic tenet of the sacrament. Now, we've got a lot of work to do to build up our understanding of this Eucharist that is called the source and summit of our faith in the Vatican Council documents, it's the very first document on the liturgy. As with previous series, you can follow along with us using another book that I wrote. It's called The Eucharist, a Bible Study Guide for Catholics. You're going to see a theme here, uh, do these Bible study guides. It's got almost everything we discuss here on the shows but it's already written down for you, so you can have your notes there with you, and that's a help. And look up the Bible passages. Many groups and individuals found my previous book, Saved, to be a great companion source of information as they went through this previous series on salvation. Now, you can get this new book on the Eucharist at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC. EWTNRC.com stands for Religious Catalog, and it is item T1375, 1375. Let's get up. Let's get going. <laughs> now, of course, you don't put your hat down on the brim, flatten the brim. All right, so we're going to of course, encourage you to have questions or comments for the show. Uh, you can email us. You can go online to our Facebook or YouTube pages. Or you can call us during the live show, which is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number, if you are in North America, is 800 Two two one nine four six zero eight hundred two two one nine four six zero. If you are outside North America, it is country code one, area code two o five two seven one two nine eight zero. So one two o five two seven one two nine eight zero. And if you are calling from outside North America, we'll put you right up at the front of the line. All right. Now, this is uh, something that is very, very important issue for us to understand. Um, I'll begin with the, an introduction from the book. You know, we very much need to understand the Eucharist 
and its context, not only in the Gospels and in St. Paul's epistles, but also to draw on the fact that our Lord and the Apostles were rooted in the Old Testament. And this is an important aspect. We're going to study some of the Old Testament background before we get to the Gospels on the Eucharist. And it's something, I, I still run across people every so often who ask me, why? did you study the Old Testament uh, that's done? No, it's not. It's not over. It's still very much the Word of God. And we proclaim that every Sunday, except Easter Sunday, in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed that we say each Sunday where it says that the Holy Spirit, quote, has spoken through the prophets. Now, if the Holy Spirit spoke through the Old Testament prophets, then we still need to learn from it. And it illuminates so much of the New Testament. In fact, when you study your New Testament carefully, you discover that there are 360 quotations of the Old Testament in the New Testament. Our Lord himself cites it many times. You see how the evangelists frequently will say, and this was done to fulfill the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah or Zechariah or David and so on. So that, that's something that the, they'll say many times. Our Lord will cite the Old Testament as something he fulfilled. And then think back on what our Lord uh, said on the way to Emmaus in Luke 24, verse 25. O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. Notice his, his question. That's obviously a rhetorical question because they are being foolish not to understand that, um, that you, you're slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. And then later on, he went back to Jerusalem. They went back too from a mass. And then he met with the apostles in the upper room. And he, it says there in the same chapter, Luke 24, but verse 45, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. So this was a prediction in the Old Testament. And Christ wanted them to understand and many times I thought that um, I would, you know, have liked to have seen a list of the passages our Lord had explained to them on Easter Sunday night. So well, why didn't you write that down, St. Luke? Until years later, as I was teaching the Acts of the Apostles to my students, I realized he did write it down. In Acts, think about how the various sermons delivered by St. Peter on Pentecost and at the temple when he cured the man who was um, crippled from birth and the various times he was giving uh, uh, defenses before the Sanhedrin or before the Romans and so on, that as they would speak, they would include those passages. That's where it was written down. But instead of just getting a list, now, if you get, just get a list, you might miss it. But with the, by seeing it in the context of how the apostles use those passages, it shows that they understand what Jesus said and they applied it. 
So then you can find those just by going through Acts. And so on our part, we do very well to make sure that we understand the Old Testament. It'll help us understand the life of Christ in the context of Judaism in which he grew up. Remember, it says that he uh, was subject to the law. He obeyed the law. He sinned in nothing. We will make better sense of it by understanding Judaism. And by the way, just as a little side point, for those who might still be tempted to take seriously the foolishness in the various Gnostic Gospels, because you get those people every so often, especially if they watch the History Channel. Uh, I think they ought to rename that channel. If I were naming it today, I would call it Sasquatch Central. <laughs> but be that as it may, you know, they, they've moved away from real history. But you can, when you read the actual Gnostic Gospels, you see that they have nothing to do with a Jewish background. They come from a culture of greco roman especially Greek philosophy, in, especially in Egypt, the way that Neoplatonic philosophy affected them. It has nothing to do with Judaism. Whereas in the New Testament, you best understand what's going on by looking to Jewish sources. As one Jewish woman I baptized uh, said to me, hey, you Catholics are using our prayers. We are. You know, a lot of our prayers are right out of the Jewish prayer book. You know, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts, lift them up to the Lord. And then the holy, holy, holy. It's all from Jewish prayers. And I said, of course we're using your prayers. All the big names in the Catholic Church are Jews. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, Peter, Paul, Andrew. <laughs> so, of course, we, they brought that with them. And that means you can best understand our Lord and the Apostles in the context of their Jewish roots. And that's very important for us to understand. And it's very, very enriching. So given that, um, we want to ex examine what Jesus taught about the Eucharist um, in the New Testament but allow his teaching to be illuminated by the Old Testament and by Jewish practice. We'll refer to some of the rabbinic practices because, again, you, you do better to read the Mishnah, which is a collection of the sayings of rabbis from about 135 B.C. until 200 A.D., You'll understand more about Jesus and the apostles by reading that than you ever would by reading the Gnostic Gospels. Yeah, it's just it's not going to help. And you'll understand the vocabulary that our Lord uses, especially in uh, the chapter 2 of the, my book. We'll especially see the vocabulary for the institution of the Eucharist. It comes right out of... Old Testament laws regarding sacrifice. And we'll um, uh, want to understand those sacrifices and the, the vocabulary. Um, the role of the Passover, that's a very important part of our background for understanding this. Um, for instance, we'll have to deal with the issue of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Remember, that's what St. John called him. In John chapter 1, verse 29, he sees Jesus coming along. And he says, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And to understand the meaning of that for the Eucharist and also for the life and death of Jesus. You know, um, we'll have to study the roots for that in Isaiah chapter 53 and see that being fulfilled in Christ, especially in the book of Revelation. 
and we'll spend a whole chapter just going over chapter 3, will be about the role of the Lamb of God, you know, from uh, Old Testament through Revelation. And then we we'll also have to learn to deal with the very serious command by Jesus to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Uh, this will be very much understandable only when we see that he's claiming to be God commanding this. And his divinity becomes more clear as we understand the Old Testament. It's a very important part. And in the Old Testament, uh, sacrifices. Uh, we'll take a look at what the Levitical priests did, the high priests and the other priests and the Levites, uh, especially when we see in Hebrews that Jesus is the one true high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And now that connects with um, the, the priesthood of the Old Testament. That will be very important. We'll look at the high priest, especially in his function, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and how Christ has a different Day of Atonement, namely Good Friday. It's the six months apart from the Yom Kippur of Judaism, but it'll be very important for us to understand. We'll do that in chapter 1 and understand that Jesus is the high priest of a new covenant. And in all this, try to grow in faith in the Eucharist and understanding of Christ's saving work in the Eucharist. Because if we're going to Mass, and we need to be, again, this is one of the other problems. As Catholics lost authentic Catholic teaching on the Eucharist, and watered it down to an expression of the community. Catholics stop going to Mass. If it's all about us, we can stay home and be about us. But if this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, his soul and divinity, and that it is part of the way of salvation and having eternal life, Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life. Then it becomes more seriously important. And, and I'm not by any means putting the blame on any one person as to why we don't understand it. I'm certainly not blaming the Vatican Council. The Vatican Council didn't change one iota of our teaching. But there are a lot of people who did water it down to make it all about us and how we are sharing and we're looking at each other and singing songs about how great we are instead of singing to God how great thou art. An awful lot of that. So we very much want to do that. And I'd like to cite a quote from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, Pope Emeritus now, in his encyclical Sacramentum Caritatis, which means Sacrament of Charity, paragraph 90. I encourage all of you to discover ever more fully in the Eucharist the sacrament of Christ's sacrificial love, the inspiration and strength needed to work ever more generously for the spread of God's kingdom and the growth of the civilization of love. This is something that's very, very important so that we learn how to live this out in our own daily lives. All right, let's take a break. And after having gone through the introduction to this book, we will start today with chapter one on the Old Testament background of the Eucharist. So please stay with us.
Okay, let's start off with an introduction to the Old Testament background. This has to do with all of redemption as well as the Eucharist. Think about how the first 11 chapters of the Old Testament, first 11 chapters of uh, Genesis, are primarily about the origins of the human race, its development, and the various nations. And Israel is very distinctive in this history, by the way. Most of the other ancient peoples would see themselves as the first nation to be created and therefore the one directly made by God and therefore the real human beings. And in fact, in a lot of Native American languages, the name of their own tribe means the human beings. Therefore, anybody who is not of their tribe is not a human being. That's not unusual for a lot of tribes. Their, their own mythology says that they're the original people, so we're the real human beings. Other people, or who knows what got in there, so they, and they come up with usually insulting uh, solutions to that, insulting options. Um, Israel does not do that. Israel does not see themselves as the original human being. They are people who came much, much later, and they trace that in Genesis 1 through 11. They go back uh, to that. And they come, you know, pretty late in the story, you know, about uh, uh, 19, 1800 BC. So you know, that's not that long ago, only about 4,000 years. What's that? Yesterday's newspaper. But it also is a history of human sin. That's the other reality. And this is also one of the most distinctive components of the biblical mentality. They recognize that all human beings are sinners. And they even include the episodes where their greatest heroes in the Old Testament are sinners. And that gets carried on in the New Testament. The apostles have the same quality of honesty that belongs to the, the Israelite mentality, that they are completely honest about their, their own sinfulness. They don't hide it. Again, you don't see the ancient kings having their sins described in the chronicles of the pharaohs or the chronicles of the Assyrians or Babylonians. If they might have gotten killed and the next guy didn't like them, then they'd put in their sins. But if they had a peaceful you know, move from one guy to his son and so on, they never bring up the sins. You know, they're all perfect. But in Israel, they, they, they bring that in. And that goes back to our first parents when, who disobeyed God's command not to eat from the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil. And um, by the way, that's one of the reasons why fasting and abstaining during Lent is so appropriate. The first sin came from eating something you're not supposed to eat. So back off from that, just to remind ourselves. Um, we see the uh, continued development of sin at every stage of uh, sin with Cain and Abel, the story of the flood and, and such. But then we also see something else. With the end of these different, like for instance, um, in the story of Cain and Abel, and in the flood, offering sacrifices to God plays prominently, doesn't it? 
Noah offered some of the clean animals as a sacrifice, you know, when he got out of the ark. Uh, Cain and Abel had sacrifice, one acceptable, one not. And then we see in Genesis 12 that there is this new move um, where the Lord calls a man, a very elderly man. Now think about this, starting your uh, a whole new career as the founder of a new nation at age 75. Your wife is a nice young thing, is 65, <laughs> and you're 75, and you're going to start a new family. That's not usually what you think about, you know, as, as I enter into my 70s. We're thinking more about, you know, starting to shut down things, put things away, get them in order, you know. That's, that's more where you start to think. No, no, we're moving. We're going to start a whole new people here. Um, and it's God who took that initiative. In Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will become a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse. And in, all the, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's another element here. Not only is he called to start a new family, he's called away from uh, Iraq, he has to walk across over to the Holy Land, to Israel. That's a good long distance. You know, they talk about or the jet airplanes that might be flying back and forth needing to have refueling planes along the way. You know, for them it was camel refueling, but, you know, they're eating what they could and getting water where they could. But this is a long journey. And we see that Abram accepted that call because it's not only about his family, it's for all the families of the earth. This is a universal mission and that all families are going to be blessed in him. He is called to become a blessing. And this is extremely important. And so we see in uh, verse uh, 6 uh, of Genesis 12, Abram, because that's his name still, Abram. Avram means you know, great fa father or exalted father. Avram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there, he moved on to the hill country in the east of Bethel, pitched his tent with Bethel in the west, I on the east, and he built an altar to the Lord and invoke the name of the Lord. Notice, he continues to offer sacrifice as he comes into that land. He is dedicating this land, consecrating this land by offering these sacrifices. And then we um, also see that after he builds altars at Shechem, and by the way, you can see the place we built it. The high place where they had ancient altars is still there. It's right behind Jacob's well. You know, so you go to Jacob's well, go around the block, and there it is. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. I haven't been there myself. And then uh, in chapter 13, verse 8, Abram said to Lot, who was his nephew, let there be no strife between you and me, between your herders and my herders, for we are brethren. Now, a lot of times the English will say kindred, but he said, no, we're brothers. Even though it wasn't his brother, it's his nephew. That's how, that's one of the passages where we see that there's this kind of um, uh, loose, looseness about the use of the word brother when you, when you hear that. But then in verse 18, as uh, Lot 
goes over to the east, to Sodom and Gomorrah, looked like good real estate at the time. But again, it's all in all real estate issues. It's location, location, location. Sodom and Gomorrah weren't going to work out quite so well as far as that goes. Um, what we see then, he uh, Abram goes over to Hebron, to an area called Mamre, and he offers sacrifices there. And they keep, his descendants keep building altars and offering sacrifices until they migrated to Egypt. And uh, once they are liberated from slavery in Egypt under Moses, uh, they get a co combination of moral commandments. Lord gives them the Ten Commandments, which are about morality, right? Which is supposed to do basic laws. And he also gives a lot of liturgical laws. Lots and lots of d directions on how to offer sacrifices. Most Christians don't read that much. We don't read those sections. Leviticus, we tend to skip over. We don't find that as interesting. But it's extremely important for us because it points out that the liturgical laws are greater in number than the moral laws. Why is that? Because it's showing that, A, the purpose of Israel, going back to Abram, is to offer adoration to God and offer him sacrifice as part of that worship. That's the first step. Secondly, you have to be in good moral order before you worship. God does not tolerate people coming to offer him sacrifice if their personal morality is out of order. You ought not to worship until you get right with God. That is very, very important. And this is not like, in Rome, for instance, they didn't care. All they cared about was, did you do the sacrifices right? Did you follow the liturgical law? They didn't care about the morality. Israel's God insists on that, that you have to obey the moral law in order to have authentic worship of God. And when you commit sins, you have to make sacrifice, sin offerings and guilt offerings, especially on the Day of Atonement. These are all key. And this is the most basic background to understanding the New Testament. To understand the Mass as a sacrifice is to show that that sacrifice is in complete continuity with the idea that we offer sacrifice to God when we consecrate our lives and our spaces to him. But furthermore, there's complete continuity when it insists that in order to worship, you have to make yourself right with God. Seek his commandments, obey them, and ask forgiveness when you do break them. This is key. And that just as in the Old Testament it took sin offerings and guilt offerings to undo sins, so also in the New Testament will it take a sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross in order to become our new Yom Kippur, our new day of atonement, and an everlasting day at that. And without understanding that, the Mass makes no sense. So this is going to be a key part. Well, look, we need to stop there, because next week what we'll do is begin to take a look at some of the New Testament background on this. And we will um, uh, continue to see those connections. But for now, I want to go to some of the questions that people have here in our studio audience. We'll start off with this lady over here. Ma'am, 
Where are you from? I'm from Daphne, Alabama. Great place. Mm -hmm. That's what we call LA, isn't it? Right. Lower Alabama. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the part that the federal government gave us as a port area so we can have <laughs> some access to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So what is your question, ma'am? Uh, well, um, I've observed that there's a lot of turmoil in the laity and in the clergy and in the mm -hmm. hierarchy. And mm -hmm. I thought about uh, scripture tells us that God uh, draws close to the humble and he removes himself from the proud. And then I thought, so let me think. And I remembered when I was uh, a little girl, I received uh, the Eucharist on my tongue. And uh, that was did that many years and then it was changed and now I receive the Eucharist in my hands mm -hmm. and I thought uh, you know it'd be very humbling to receive the Eucharist on my tongue I mean mm -hmm. that after all these years of not doing that and being a, an adult so I thought I'll start receiving the Eucharist on my tongue because I'll be humbled and maybe even the priest is a little humbled you know too by well, that but I just wanted priest. to know your thoughts yeah you know it's for you know this is something that is an option. All of us have the option as to whether we receive in the hand or uh, receive directly on the tongue. Um, and e either one is accepted by the church. And so um, I, you know, it's not my place. To, I'm not a legislator in the church. You know, you, you keep those options. Though so I've had some people, uh, I've had one lady in particular was very upset with me, he says, why don't you tell those people at Mass at EWTN to stop receiving on the tongue? I said, ma'am, that is an, called an option because they have that option. We don't tell them that they have to receive on the tongue or that they can't. That's up to them. But it's also a way, uh, what is the best way to show my adoration of God, my recognition of his divine majesty. And that's the key of humility. Humility is not about putting ourselves down. Humility is rather about taking the attention away from us and putting the attention on the Lord God. It's from stopping to look down on other people. That's the epitome of pride. We think you can look down on them and looking up to God and seeing how small we are. And I think that that's one way to express it. Uh, certainly there are a lot of hymns that I become very bothered by because they express a certain kind of self-centeredness about how great we are. You know, and how I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm building this, I'm being this, I'm doing... This. And basically, there are hymns calling out to God saying, Hey, have you noticed how good I am? I want a little more respect from you. And that's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. The idea is for us to worship Him. And adoration of God is where true humility comes from because our attention is on somebody inherently, infinitely greater than we can ever be. And that's always good for us. All right, we have to take a break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes. So please stay with us. calling in. We have, Henry, are you there? Yes, I am, Father. Hi, where are you calling from? Kansas City, Missouri. Wonderful. Good to have you here. And what is your question? 
Well, Father, when I was I was educated uh, through the Catholic system from the grade school on, and I was taught that if you receive communion and you're conscious of grievous sin, that it is a sacrilege. Mm-hmm. Now, my question to you is this. When I go to confession, there may be just four or five people in line to go to confession, but on Sunday morning, the whole congregation goes to communion. Yeah. And I'm wondering, all those people, there has to be some of those people that are certainly aware of the fact that they have mortal sins. They're not going to confession, certainly. And so as a result, I'm led to believe that all most of those people going to communion are committing a sacrilege. So I wonder if you would address that. Thank you, Father. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, first, uh, thank you, Henry. And of course, you're just basing it on statistical analysis. That there might be some serious sinners in those communion lines. You know, this is something that um, we we very much have to address. This is not some medieval law. It is what St. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. After teaching about the Eucharist, he says, and some of you have received the Eucharist without discerning the body of Christ. That's a problem. If you don't believe that it is the body and blood of Christ, then you're running into a problem. And he says, some of you received in sin, and that's why some of you have gotten sick and died. That's how serious he thought it was. Uh, so, you know, this is a very important issue to discern the body and blood of Christ when we go to receive Holy Communion and to receive communion in the state of sanctifying grace. Um, you know, so if you're conscious of a mortal sin, then, um, you know, you do need to go to confession. And one of the difficulties, Henry, is that a lot of people truly are not aware of what the mortal sins are. Keep in mind, we live in a society that doesn't think a lot of things are mortal sins, but then they say other things are. So oftentimes, there are the politically incorrect things that bring on outrage, but more other areas of mortal sin are no big deal. Think about stealing. In some cities, if you steal $950 or less, they're not going to prosecute you. So thieves bring calculators into stores. Seriously. They're not stupid. They're just criminal. And, they, and they, they know they won't be arrested if it's $949 worth of stuff. Unless you're the store owner, that's a lot of money to be losing. And the, uh, apparently, uh, what I've seen reported in the news, that the uh, DA won't prosecute and police won't arrest. Well, then that means it's okay to steal that much. And when you see the government encouraging the use of, you know, birth control to avoid babies and uh, diseases, therefore, uh, the government tells us we've got to do this, so it's okay. See, that's oftentimes the mentality. And, by the way, there's an interesting um, chart from the Center for Disease Control showing that the, the uh, growth rate of sales of various contraceptives. And they also have that the other charts of the increase of sexually transmitted diseases and out of wedlock birth. And they follow exactly the same curve for the same years. In other words, the more condoms and other prophylactics that were used, the more sexually transmitted diseases 
and out of wedlock births that occurred. And apparently, it sounds counterintuitive, but it's because um, they uh, took more risks than they would have taken otherwise. And as a result, they, the risks don't work out. But the government said it was okay. And that if I do catch a baby and I don't really want one, it's okay by the government. They encourage us to have an abortion. And so folks don't think it's a sin. This is true with lots of things. And you know, that's one of the other things we also have to do. As uh, a matter of fact, tomorrow night's show will be a program dealing with issues of sin uh, and what is wrong and why. Why is it a sin? We have to understand that too. So we have a lot of catechesis to do. I have another question from our studio. Sir, where are you from? Uh, I'm from uh, Quantico, Virginia. Great, good to have you here, welcome. And your question? So my, my thought is um, the turmoil with the lack of understanding of the real presence. Do you, do you feel that's another, like a, a, a recreation of what happened at the Last Supper when Christ said to drink my blood and eat my body? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you know, that, that's exactly Catholic teaching, that what Christ instituted at the Last Supper, he not only did he say, this is my body, this is the cup of my blood, but then he said, do this in remembrance of me. And we're going to talk about what that word do means. It's maybe a surprising uh, use of the word asa, or poien in Greek. Um, you'll be, hopefully you'll be surprised enough to see that this is very, very important. But he ordered the apostles so much so, we consider that the moment of their ordination as the first bishops. So that they could pass, not only they could do the, uh, and celebrate the Eucharist, but also they could create other priests to do the same. So we'll talk about that uh, coming up, but yeah, very much so. I have another question. Ma'am, where are you from? Spanish Fort, Alabama. Great. Oh, that's also part of L.A. That's right. Um, I, I go to, well, I am a Maronite of the Maronite Rite. Mm -hmm. And um, the Maronites always dip the body into the blood of Jesus right. and, and give it to us on our tongue. So I've not ever touched the Eucharist in that kind of That's right. Receiving. In Maronite Rite, uh, you are not allowed to receive it in the hand. It is the priest places the Holy Eucharist on the tongue after doing what we call intinction by, you know, th that everybody receives the body and blood of Christ, but instead of drinking from the cup, it's by putting the, the dipping the host into the precious blood. So why does the Roman Catholic Church not follow that tradition or was it changed mm -hmm. many years ago? Actually, it is an option in the Roman Rite, they may do that, should they, should they desire to do so. A lot, uh, actually, I, I don't think there's any legislation against it. I, if I'm wrong, please, somebody let me know. But um, a lot of times, liturgists were against it because they wanted people to have the option to take the host themselves in their own hand. And if you give communion by intinction in the Roman rite, it's the same rule, that the, the recipient may not receive uh, this into their hand. The priest has to place it on the tongue, and the uh, communicant may not dip the host into the precious blood him or herself, because um, you know, the, you know, they have to be measured so they don't be putting your fingers into the precious blood, uh, especially since other people are going to be consuming it. You know, this is, um, especially today, you know, I, I've seen that Archdiocese of Chicago and, and I think other places are now uh, telling parishes with the rise of this coronavirus not to have people receive from the cup, you know, not to receive the precious blood because they're afraid of the coronavirus spreading and it's very, very dangerous. So, you know, that's why they're afraid. That's why we stopped giving communion to both species centuries ago, uh, fear of spread of plague. Okay. 
Word. All right, thank you. And ma'am, we have one more question. Where are you from? Yes, uh, on the Eastern Shore. Okay, great. Uh, also LA. LA. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for mentioning that the Old Testament is still alive and yeah. that Cain and Abel both made a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But one was acceptable and one was not. Mm -hmm. And we're in Lent right now. And for us to realize what we're giving up or our sacrifice, is that, are we being serious about it? Yep, yep, that's a good thing. Um, and some people I know will say to me, well, I don't want to give up something. I want to do something. And you don't have to make that choice. You can give up things and then use the money you would have spent on the things you're giving up to help out other people. So that uh, there's a prayer in the Maronite Liturgy of the Hours, and I believe it's in the Ramsho prayers of uh, Monday that it says in the prayer it says let your fasting nourish two mouths the one that fasts and the one that receives the goods of this world because you are fasting this is uh, a good thing all right and we have let's take an email um this is from dave in wisconsin uh, Father Mitch, I love watching Scripture and tradition, your other contributions to our faith. My question is on the parable of the ten virgins that you recently discussed on your program. Regarding the five wise virgins' response to the five foolish ones, they say there may not be enough oil for all of us to go around, so buy some for yourselves. This has always seemed unchristian to me, not, the not sharing part. I guess they didn't have your mom. Why do you think the parable was presented this way and how should we interpret it? Dave from Wisconsin. Dave, the, the purpose of the parable is not to give a lesson on sharing. It points out the practical wisdom. If you remember, the word that's used there is the Greek adjective phronimos, uh, which refers to a practical wisdom. And there's somebody pointing out a fact. There will not be enough if we give you some of ours. Everybody's lamp is going to go out. You have to deal with the practicality of providing oil for your own lamp. Because otherwise there won't be light for anybody. That's all that the parable is saying. And uh, it's not about sharing. It's mostly about having practical preparedness for the long haul of waiting for Christ. And I am out of time so for this long haul. The uh, show, show is all about over, so may the Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And again, please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. This network is brought to you by you. It's the only way we keep to have to keep going. So please do remember us, and we thank you already. Thank you.